Hello everybody, I hope you're all well. In the summer of 2021, many people's TikTok for you pages were inundated with glammed up college freshmen sharing their OOTDs for Bama Rush. This actually wasn't on my TikTok for you page. I was not the intended audience. And now that I'm sat here filming this video, I am probably the worst person to make this video. I am not American and I've never even been to university before, but also in a way I feel like maybe that's a good thing because I can look at it a little bit more objectively because I didn't experience this firsthand myself. I had very little knowledge of sororities before researching for this video. The only, I guess, experience I had with sororities was those, <laughs> frankly, terrifying sorority welcoming videos where they're all piled up on top of each other in the doorway and they're all clapping and chanting and singing. No, thank you. And I was very aware of my own internalized misogyny when I was writing this script. And I just wanna let everyone know that if men were doing this, I would be even more terrified. Frat houses are comparable to the seventh dimension of hell. Bama rush or rushing is basically the sorority recruitment process. And I do just wanna preface that not all rushing looks like Bama rush and not all sororities are comparable or similar to these very wealthy upper echelon sororities in the deep south. And if I'm being honest, I think that's what really captivates people, the hyper femininity, the wealth, that's why so many people were invested in Bama Rush talk. And I also think that politics plays a really big role in Greek life at the University of Alabama. Alabama, the state has been a Republican stronghold for decades. Also guys, like those dancing videos. <laughs> They're pretty hypnotizing, obviously because I was looking at so much Bama Rush content on TikTok researching for this video, my For You page ended up just becoming Bama Rush Central. And look, I couldn't stop watching them. The dancing videos are fun. And this year, HBO actually released a documentary about Bama Rush titled Bama Rush. It was directed by Rachel Fleet and it was met with a lot of mixed opinions and mixed reviews. I did watch the documentary documentary and I am going to share my thoughts later in this video. <laughs> and before we go ahead with this video, I would love to thank today's sponsor, Love and Pies. My new favorite cozy autumn vibes game. Now, it starts out with your mum's calf has been burned down and she's gone missing. The stakes are very high. <laughs> and you have to rebuild her calf and her business by merging ingredients to create different dishes, pies, cakes, sweet treats, sandwiches, and serving customers, making money, rebuilding the calf and let me tell you guys I am obsessed I'm on level 20 <laughs> I just finished rebuilding the patio Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I really do enjoy it and I play it every single day and I've spoken a lot on my podcast how I am trying to cut down using social media. I definitely do not need to be consuming 40 different people's opinions before 8am but that's a different topic for a different day. But the problem is I keep my phone in my hand for work so I find that when I open my phone I just immediately click on a social media app but Love and Pies is just a good thing to keep me stimulated whilst I'm working and it's just a little bit of fun. Sorry, it's really satisfying. It always goes bloop, 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 bloop. Like it's just nice when I have a break from work to do something on my phone other than scrolling on social media. It's just the perfect game to cuddle up on the sofa too on a nice brisk autumn evening, little cup of hot chocolate, you know how it is. And there are always new events, themes, passes, decorations. So the game is always new and exciting. There's always something new to do. There is just something so satisfying about building your calf from the ground up. I'm talking about people. I will actually insert some screen recording of my calf so you guys know that I have been playing this. And speaking of autumn, Love and Pies have a lot of new and exciting autumn themed events coming up. They have a two week Halloween themed event, a month long autumn themed picnic pass and all of these events offer so many exciting prizes and also lots of autumn themed decorations for your calf. I have just put out some Halloween themed chairs in my calf. It looks great. I honestly just really enjoyed this game. It's nice to have a break from social media and the game has four and a half stars on the 
the app store for a reason, guys. I also know that my friend Eleanor is really into this game. We're loving pies, girlies. Mm -hmm. And the best news is, is that it is free to download. So make sure you use my link in the description to download Love and Pies. Let me know how you guys get on because I need to know if anyone else is as obsessed and addicted as I am. As someone left a comment on my podcast, nice to know that someone else treats Love and Pies like a full-time job. And thank you again, Love and Pies, for sponsoring this video. Let's get into it. So let's just bring it back to the basics for a second. A sorority is a university society for female students. Now, maybe I'm just thick. <laughs> I thought that universities in America only had one sorority per campus, but it turns out there are multiple sororities. The University of Alabama has 22 different sororities. In the UK, it's a little bit different. Our universities have societies instead of sororities and fraternities. And a lot of these societies exist so you can bond over a shared interest, whether it's sport, also to meet students who are like you. There are LGBTQ plus societies, black and minority ethnic societies, women's societies. But also, if we're being honest, a lot of societies at UK universities exist so people have an excuse to meet up and drink together. I know that a lot of universities in the UK have rowing societies, but they don't have a rowing team. The campus isn't even near a body of water. It's just an excuse for students to meet up and drink together together. But I was curious to know, as someone who hasn't been to university, why would women and college freshmen want to join a sorority? I actually found this article on the Pi Beta Phi website. Uh, by the way, there will be many mispronunciations of these sororities. I apologize in advance. I also found out listening to a podcast that the reason why it's called Greek life and the Greek system is just because they use Greek letters. It's not, I found this out on the Binchtopia uh, Sororities and Fraternities podcast. It did not originate in Greece. It's got nothing to do with Greece. It is literally just because they use the Greek letters. I'm like, all right. <laughs> so here are 10 reasons by Pi Beta Phi, Pi Beta Phi to join a sorority. Number one, join a community of like-minded women. Number two, you'll participate in service opportunities. Number three, you'll receive leadership opportunities. Number four, you'll find a sense of belonging. Number five, you'll receive academic support. Number six, you'll make your voice heard. Sorry, I need to burp, oh my God. <laughs> Number six, uh. Number seven, you'll gain campus connections. Number eight, you'll have accountability. That, number eight, that sounds scary. <laughs> that sounds awful. Number nine, you'll have access to a network of women. Number 10, you'll join a sisterhood. Now, I'm sure that many women join sororities for these reasons, but I don't know, something about seeing these really young girls wake up at the absolute crack of dawn to do their hair and their makeup, wear their best Lululemon outfit, stacks of jewelry from Amazon or Cartier, spend all of the rush week in heels, I don't know. I don't think they're doing that just for leadership opportunities. Especially when you find out the fees of these very wealthy upper echelon societies. Remember what I said earlier that this video doesn't apply to all societies or sororities. I'm talking more about the rich ones. So average members at an Alabama sorority typically pay between $4,170 to $4,978 per semester. And by the way, that's not even if you want to live in the sorority house. If you want to live in the sorority house, you typically pay between $7,465 to $9,445 per semester. And I'm pretty sure that's not including college tuition fees. That is the same price as private school. But these fees actually make a lot of sense when you see the sorority houses because I watched a few sorority house tours on YouTube. And let me tell you, not only are they bougie, but they are massive. They are absolutely huge. Now, maybe my perception of what is big has been warped by living in London. I see a two bedroom flat with a balcony and I'm like, oh my God, so much space. But no, these sorority houses are absolutely huge and they're always very clean, very immaculate. They're decorated, not to my specific taste. I would 
compare the decorations to what I could imagine a Republican well. senator's wife decorates her house like. All of these houses are extremely clean. You also have chefs that cook all of your meals. You also have a full fridges of drinks and snacks at your disposal. But it does make sense why these sorority houses are so big because I couldn't find exact numbers of how many girls typically live in a sorority house, but I'm pretty sure it's around 100 girls live in these sorority houses. Sorry, imagine having 99 flatmates. <laughs> It does start to make sense why these sorority fees are so high because you are essentially paying for someone to look after your child. All sorority houses have sorority mothers, which is an older woman who lives in the house and basically chaperones the girls around, make sure they're following all the rules. And also fraternity houses do have frat mums as well. Also, I know the title of this video does say sorority talk and bamarash or whatever I've decided to call it, but I will be talking about both sides of Greek life. I will be talking about sororities and fraternities. I will be focusing a lot on fraternities at the end of this video when we start talking about politics. So yeah, just bear that in mind. This won't be all about sororities. It's about both. But let's get back onto the topic at hand. Bama Rush. Sorry, I cannot stop doing it in that accent. And these very wealthy Alabama upper echelon sororities. Now, I wanted to put myself in the position of someone who I'm a college freshman and I want to rush at the University of Alabama. I wanted to know exactly what I needed to do to get into a sorority other than having rich parents. I did find plenty of YouTube videos from sorority sisters at the University of Alabama, which did actually really help me. And I do just want to say that a majority of the videos that I've watched on YouTube, on TikTok, all of the girls do seem perfectly nice. I don't want it to seem like I'm like directly attacking these girls. I'm really not. I'm more just analyzing, breaking down and critiquing the system of Greek life at American colleges. So let's actually talk about the rushing process. So it sounds like I'm saying Russian, <laughs> rushing. So before you even rush, you have to apply. You can't just show up. You have to pay a fee, but apparently the fee goes towards your rushing t-shirt, which I think you wear on your second day. Sorry, I know so much about this. <laughs> so when when you apply, you have to send in your degree, your GPA, a picture of yourself, your hobbies, your interests, also a video of yourself explaining why you want to be part of a sorority. And all of the videos that I watched suggested getting a letter of recommendation from a past sorority alumni or like a past sorority sister. So day one is admin day. Every girl told me that this is a very casual day. You don't need to dress up, just dress in like a cute tracksuit or like a cute little workout set or something and it's the most boring day you basically sit in a hall with a bunch of other girls and you watch 17 different videos from 17 different sororities explaining what they're about who they are also their philanthropy their philanthropy I cannot say that word plays a really big role in like their sorority identity. And from these videos, you have to choose your top 12 sororities. So you rank them all, and then you have to rank your five backup sororities. And the sorority rushing process is a mutual selection process. So basically you have to choose them and they have to choose you to proceed in the rushing process with that sorority house. So on day two, you find out which sorority houses chose you. And this is the day where you wear your rushing t-shirt. And a lot of the girls are watching said parrot with a cute pair of shorts or a mini skirt and the reason why I'm bringing up clothing so much is remember guys the most popular Bama Rush content is the OOTDs clothing plays a really big role in the rushing process that's why every video I watch a girl was recommending what I wear the overarching theme was to just always look good always look put together always look cute and presentable every Bama Rush TikTok video I watched a majority of the girls were in a full face of makeup and had fully styled hair and were wearing a very coordinated outfit stacks of jewelry they looked very put together on some of the days they're wearing heels oh my god I could never nine hours standing up wearing heels no see this is my shoe of choice for today <laughs> Also on day two, you meet the sororities that you have chosen and they've chosen you. And this is when the piling up in the doorway occurs and they do like the singing and the chanting. And you basically just casually get to know some of the sorority sisters. The girls in the video told me that you would meet on average between two to three sorority sisters per sorority 
house. And then there is the philanthropy round, which typically lasts three days, where you pair up with a girl from each sorority and you both discuss philanthropy. You discuss the sorority's philanthropy, you discuss your own philanthropy. And then the next round is the sisterhood round. For this round, you have to drop five sorority houses. So you are left with seven. And also remember that the houses can drop you. And during this round, from what the girls described, it sounded like the DMC round, like the deep and meaningful. Like you have a deep chat with all of the sorority sisters about what sisterhood means to you. You know, like the nightmare conversations that you get trapped in in the smoking area of a nightclub kind of like those. I found out some very interesting tips and advice on things that you should not talk about during your sorority rushing process. In the Bam Rush documentary, they described it as the five Bs. Boys, booze, bucks, Bible, Biden. That basically means no talking about frat boys, no talking about partying or drinking. Do not bring up religion unless you're bringing up like, oh, I like to go to church on Sundays. Also don't bring up politics and also don't bring up money. But it's not exactly quite like don't bring up money. It's just, you have to talk about it in a subtle way. You have to sort of implement it into the conversation, which isn't just like, oh yeah, my parents are actually on like 400K a year or oh, my parents bought me the $7,000 bracelet. No, that's tacky. But what you do wanna say is you wanna say things like, oh yeah, I like to spend my summers in the Hamptons. My family actually have a house out there. Or you know, even just showing up with a full head of bleached, perfectly toned bright blonde extensions it's telling them something it's telling them that you are rich without you actually having to say it something that did really really interest me though about this was the fact that you aren't allowed to talk about drinking or boys because i feel like a big part of the college uh, experience is going to parties and drinking and meeting frat boys. And it's just crazy. It's such a big part of the college experience and why so many girls are there. Obviously they're for an education as well, but they're also there to have fun. But even if you mention it, you will be dropped from all the sorority houses because word spreads. Alabama is a very conservative state. So a lot of the girls who join sororities are there for the connections to the fraternities, but you just aren't allowed to talk about it. And what these connections to fraternities mean for their future. And I think there's just such a big emphasis on sisterhood within sororities, especially post gender rev revolution, which we're gonna talk more about later in this video. You can't even breathe a word about men, despite the fact that a lot of these sororities in the deep south and really right-wing states in America basically act as a second layer of gender socialization and are actively training up these girls to be appealing to men. Again, we are gonna talk more about this later, but like guys, I literally can't stop running my mouth. Like someone stop me. But a lot of these sorority houses allegedly have rules such as not being able to have wet hair on the first floor. If you want to leave your dorm room, you have to have two out of three done, your hair done, your makeup done, or a proper outfit on. I'm gonna shut my mouth. We're gonna talk more about this later. And then you have your pref night, which is the night where you choose your top two sororities. And then you go and visit both sororities and you tell which one you're sort of feeling the most. And then you rank your final two houses. And then it's the bid day where you receive your bid and you find out what sorority house you went to. And then you do like the running to your sorority house where you will run across a field to your sorority house. And then you will go out for dinner or you do some sort of fun activity and then you're part of a sorority, baby. One important detail I missed is that if you are joining a sorority, you are called a PNM, a potential new member. Bama Rush typically lasts nine days. Jinkies. That's a lot of time. As we all know, Bama Rush took TikTok by storm in the summer of 2021, and it even created sorority micro celebrities such as Kylan Darnell. I'm not gonna get fully, fully into why so many people enjoy this content. But I do think that there are like a few reasons which have been floating around in my head. I think watching wealthy girls share their Lululemon OOTDs with their Golden Goose sneakers and their Cartier bracelets, it's just interesting. People have always been interested in the shenanigans of wealthy people. So I think that's just something that naturally sparks human interest and curiosity. Also, I think Bama Rush 
which is such a, it's almost a caricature of the rushing process. It's that extreme. It's so far removed from not only some people's lives who aren't even from America, didn't even go to university like myself, but also some people that did rush for a sorority. Bama Rush could be so drastically different to their own sorority rushing experience that they just find it really interesting and they want to stay tuned. Remember, only a really small minority of girls and women will apply to rush at these really upper echelon, upper crust, wealthy sororities. And also remember that Greek life is infamously extremely private. So we are being let in on a process which we have never been let in on before. Even if it is just a 10 second OOTD on TikTok or a 30 second update of how someone's rushing process is going, that's more than we have ever known before. And I do think that Bama Rush Talk gave a pretty unique insight into the type of girls who want to rush for a sorority and want to join a top sorority at the University of Alabama. And I think that's why Bama Rush specifically blew up over any other rushing process in America, because not only does it seem to just be on the extreme end of Greek life, hyper femininity, wealth, people even hire rush coaches, guys. I found out about rush coaches. They are basically older women who used to be in sororities themselves who will coach and train your child to join a sorority and make sure they do a really good job in the rushing process. It costs $3,000 a pop to hire a rush coach and they are extremely popular and lucrative. The University of Alabama has the highest sorority enrollment rate in the country. The University of Alabama has around 12,000 students in which 39% are a part of Greek life. So, so much money is being funneled into the Greek system at the University of Alabama. And a majority of the Bama Rush girls that I've seen on TikTok are just so perfectly glammed up. Their hair's always done, their makeup's always done. They always have an extremely put together outfit. They are almost the picture perfect vision of a Southern belle. And another thing that Bama Rush Talk gave some really interesting insight to is how these women shop and how Americans shop in general. I read a really interesting article on The Atlantic by Amanda Mull where she talks about the fact that these girls are not stupid. They know exactly how they need to look, what they need to wear in order to be accepted by these top wealthy sororities. Rich people buy nice things and when they see someone else with that nice thing, they recognize that them as one of their own. It's very similar to what I said in my quiet luxury video. To put it very simply, rich recognizes rich. And to quote Amanda Moll directly from the article, as in the case with any type of high status group, the best way to gain entry is usually to demonstrate that you already belong. In this case, that you understand the norms and expectations that knit the group together. That's why rush outfits have long been the point of emphasis among PNMs and why they have primacy on rush talk. When you're getting relatively brief periods of FaceTime to make your case for joining a socially and economically elite group, your clothing and appearance really matter. A head full of obviously unnatural but perfectly toned bright blonde hair, for example, costs hundreds of dollars a month to maintain. Its presence suggests both a fluency with the group's aesthetic standards and access to the economic resources necessary to adhere to them at all times. So too do $600 Golden Goose sneakers and a wrist full of $400 David Yerman bracelets, stacked with one $7,350 Cartier love bracelet if your parents really want the world to know that they've raised a queen bee. And another phenomenon which Amanda Moll spoke about, which applies to all rich people, not just sorority sisters, is the fact that rich people have started wearing a real mixture of brands from the higher end to the lower end of their outfits. Anything from Cartier, Golden Goose, all the way to Amazon and Shein. In previous decades, people's shopping habits lined up with their economic status. So working class people were typically shopped from thrift stores. Middle class people would shop high street like Gap and Topshop and upper class people would shop designer. But fast fashion blew this thing wide open. To quote Amanda Mulligan, the internet has caused a kind of consumer context collapse. You're no longer seeking out products to evaluate and choosing which establishments you enter. Instead, those products are pursuing your attention, usually unbidden through targeted ads online and a 
especially on social media. And fast fashion is irresistible to even the richest of people, especially when your peers are also wearing fast fashion and they're shopping their jewelry from Amazon, they're buying mini dresses from Shein. It's almost an unspoken permission. And honestly, if you are a rich person who refuses to shop from these brands, not for ethics reasons, because you're a label snob, it honestly just comes across at you've got your head shoved up your ass. And not only that, but designer brands have also started marketing towards the middle and working classes who want to buy designer pieces in order to appear richer. So for the first time, ever maybe people are beginning to dress really similarly to one another and it's quite difficult to gauge someone's class through their dress sense now i mean it's not that difficult but it's a bit more difficult than it used to be now before we get into the nitty-gritty of this video the formative femininity racism politics i want to talk about the documentary so i watched the bam rush documentary that hbo released this year it was directed by rachel fleet it received a lot of mixed reviews and opinions and i can understand now that i've watched it i do have some positive things to say about it i thought that it was edited really well i thought that it was a good documentary to watch if you had absolutely zero knowledge on Greek life or sororities um, and fraternities. I thought that it provided a somewhat intimate insight into the types of girls that want to rush for sororities. But that's sort of where my <laughs> positivity ends. I do have a lot of criticisms. I just think that it really fell flat. I think it's a really big shame because I think that sorority and fraternity life is really interesting. And and I think that there's so much to it. Maybe it was for legal reasons. Maybe it was because they had a pretty quick turnover in the documentary. I'm pretty sure they made it in less than a year. And something which is as secretive as Greek life, you essentially need to do investigative journalism to find out anything about it. So of course things fell flat and maybe they couldn't put certain info in because they might get sued. But they'd basically start talking about something really interesting and like messed up about Greek life and you'd be like, oh my God. And then it would just completely veer off into a different topic, especially with the director. She spoke a lot about her journey with her alopecia and the fact that she'd rushed for a sorority. And I thought there was was maybe a place for that in the documentary but I didn't feel like it was entirely relevant I'm gonna be honest and she steered onto her alopecia so often in the documentary like it was it wasn't just once it was multiple times she would veer off into her own personal story which honestly I didn't feel like was entirely appropriate and it felt like she was kind of projecting quite a lot like it came across as a little bit too personal for my liking and it's not like I don't like a personal documentary I like it when documentary makers connect personally to what they are talking about it's what I want to do in the future you know but I think that there's maybe a line and I think maybe I would have cared a little bit less about the personal interjections if the documentary had actually been good <laughs> Something which I found very notable whilst researching and creating this video, oh my God, I just spat on myself, sorry, is the notable lack of men. And I know that that sounds really obvious, like, duh, sororities are societies for female students, of course there's gonna be a lack of men. But a lot of female students in these upper echelon wealthy societies, sororities rather, do join sororities for the connections to the fraternities, yet men, masculinity, fraternities is completely absent from all sorority content. And the absence of men alongside with the fact that a lot of the sorority content and sorority spaces I've seen are just so hyper feminine. All of the girls are always glammed up, hair done, makeup done, full outfit on, stacks of jewellery. I don't think it's particularly surprising that in spaces this hyper feminine, misogyny unfortunately can run rampant because we do need to ask ourselves why are these spaces? Space is so hyper feminine. And by the way, I know someone's gonna say it, this isn't me trying to shit on hyper femininity. I am hyper feminine. <laughs> but there's a reason why my appearance is hyper feminine. It's because I feel the need to look like this to be treated like a human being. Ooh. 
cool. But back onto the question, we do need to ask ourselves why these spaces are so hyper feminine in the first place. And the Bama Rush documentary actually addressed some of the alleged rules within these sororities, such as you aren't allowed to be on the ground floor with wet hair. If you leave your dorm room, you have to have two out of the three things done, an outfit on, your makeup done, or your hair done. And also the widespread rules amongst all sororities that you aren't allowed to have any alcohol in the house, you aren't allowed to throw any parties, and you aren't allowed to have any boys over. To break this down, I think it's important again to look at the history of sororities. I read an interesting dissertation by Sarah Bess Rowan, which I will leave linked down below along with all of my other sources, obviously, where she explores the concept of nobler womanhood within sorority life and culture. The first ever sorority house was founded in 1870 at the DePaul University. It was named Kappa Alpha Theta and these sororities were created so women in college education had societies to go to because they weren't allowed in the male societies. But it's not only that. To quote Sarah Bess Rowan, the Theta founders found their femininity attacked and their morals questioned both within and outside the classroom simply because of their college attendance, which challenged the women to show themselves and those around them that college did not unsex them and thus nobler womanhood was born. I'm gonna read this in a posh accent because I feel like the person that wrote this is probably posh. The object of this society shall be to advance the interests of its members, to afford an opportunity for improvement in compositions and debate and elocution, to cultivate those social qualities which become a woman and to provide for its members associates bound by a common interest. Don't get me wrong, I'm sure that these sororities were created in the 1800s were for women who were in college education to find community with one another and also sororities actively encouraged women especially in the 1800s and the early 1900s to complete their college education because it was a harsh environment guys it was literally the 1800s but a large part as to why sororities were founded was for these women to defend their own femininity attending college with so many men in the 1870s really pushed the bounds of what femininity was at that time. Again, to quote Bess Rowan, this function of shame as part of the foundational emotions of theta is important because of the way it seeks to re-establish normativity. Hence the phrase, nobler womanhood was added to Theta's tenets. And of course, it's understandable why the founders of Theta felt their femininity was attacked by attending college. It was literally the 1870s. But the problem is, is that Theta's tenets have not changed since the 1870s and still exist throughout Theta's rituals and formal meetings. And this is where the problems come in. Theta was founded on the Theta's founder's desires to defend their own femininity. And now this is colliding with modern day college campuses, post gender revolution, post sexual revolution, post multiple waves of feminism. And I found a really interesting article titled The Gender Revolution on Greek Row. I actually discovered this on TikTok from this TikTok user here. I actually got the entire inspiration for this video from this TikTok. In this article and this study, researchers compared sorority sisters in the 1970s to the 2010s and ask them basically the same set of questions to see how attitudes have changed, how social norms have changed. And it's very interesting. Both women then and now spoke about the membership requirements of sororities being dependent on beauty, wealth, and implicit whiteness. And also the fraternity men controlling huge aspects of their sexual and social lives. Not only do they throw the parties, they also provide the alcohol and they can only sleep with fraternity men in frat houses because men aren't allowed in sorority houses. The difference is that in the 1970s, the women sort of just accepted that it was just the way it was. Meanwhile, in the 2010s, women are a lot more vocal and will speak up more about it and will say that it's just not fair, that it's actually really sexist that these rules still exist. The difference is, is that in the 1970s, these power imbalances were just accepted as the norm. And in the 1970s, admissions into top sororities were dependent on 
beauty, wealth and implicit whiteness, which is the same in the 2010s, but now being career driven and having hobbies is really, really important. But having career ambitions in the 1970s was actually seen as unnecessary at the least and an active hindrance at the most. Beauty and wealth and the right connections and implicit whiteness does play a really big part in getting into the top sororities today, but now is expected to have career ambitions, to have hobbies you're passionate about, to have a few philanthropy notches on your belt. There is a much higher pressure to being it all. And it actually, sorry, doing Ariana Grande. And it actually reminds me a lot of how the women's drive to join the workforce because women actually do more labor now than men because even though they work full time and 45% of the time in the UK make more money than their male partners, they still pick up a majority of the household chores. The division of household labor has not changed all that much since before women went to work. Um, So women actually do, it's called the double shift where they do a lot more household labor, child labor. So even though obviously women being able to work is good that's not me saying that women shouldn't be going to work but it's almost driven like women's rights in a little bit of a circle do you know what I mean like I don't know I feel like I've been mugged off a little bit (laughs) and the women of the 2010s did complain that the rules between the sorority houses and the fraternity houses were unfair and sexist as they are fraternity houses are allowed to have alcohol they're allowed to throw parties they're allowed to have girls stay over but sorority houses are not allowed any of that. And not only is that unfair and also sexist and misogynistic, but also it's actively endangering female students. The only times that they're allowed to party, consume alcohol and have sex is within fraternity house walls and the women can't keep an eye on each other the sorority sisters can't keep an eye on each other at all times. The rates of sexual violence in American colleges is actually quite horrific to read. You are three times more likely to rape someone if you are part of a fraternity house. And I just found this on the pubmed.ncbi. A total of 29% of sorority women reported having been sexually assaulted while in college, four times the rate among non-sorority members. Perhaps this this isn't controversial. (laughs) And this is because fraternity brothers are far more likely to have each other's backs and to have bro code with each other. And I feel like bro code should only apply to like, oh, don't fuck my ex, not, oh, if I rape someone, don't tell anyone about it. So the only time that these girls can party, consume alcohol, have sex is within the walls of a fraternity house where all the fraternity brothers have the control. This absolutely leads to an increased risk of getting spiked or roofed feed. This absolutely leads to an increased risk of sexual violence. Another thing in this study which I found really interesting was the reasons between the women in the 1970s to the women in the 2010s as to why they wanted to join a sorority. In the 1970s women did cite wanting to make friends as a reason but they also openly spoke about the fact that they wanted connections to the fraternity houses. They wanted access to the fraternity houses in order to find an appropriate boyfriend and not only that but having an overt interest in socializing with the fraternity houses was actually seen as a good thing during the rushing process. And if you didn't mention the fraternity houses, that was seen as a little bit of a red flag. So an active and overt interest in fraternity houses was seen as one of the necessary like characteristics and traits to join a sorority, along with good looks and wealth and family background and also a letter of recommendation. And also it was, sorry, you can tell, I'm (laughs) sorry guys, I get really, really fidgety when I'm sat down for a really long time. Also, it was very socially accepted to prioritize your dating life over your friendships with your sorority sisters. Nowadays, even though many girls and women join sororities for the connections to fraternities, it is seen as very taboo, very socially unacceptable to even mention, even breathe a word about fraternities during the rushing process. And it will lead to you getting blacklisted from a majority of sororities. To quote the study, in both historical eras, a woman's looks and perceived sociality remain crucial for being invited into a sorority. What has changed is how openly women are willing to talk about this criterion. Also, sororities are ranked hierarchically. So the top sororities are far more likely to recruit the prettiest girls, the skinniest girls, the smartest and most driven girls because they want to remain the top sorority. And they also want the top fraternities to be interested in them, to invite them to things. And also it's not just about fraternity houses as well. A lot of these girls that they recruit end up becoming their connections in life. So you want to recruit someone who is 
is not only pretty but also rich but also comes from a family background of politics because you want to get into politics and it's really good to have that connection remember in the modern day it's mostly about who you know not what you know and this tier ranking system hasn't changed much from the 1970s to today it's just the difference is women are now expected to be career driven and ambitious the new sorority women must embody traditionally feminine traits plus the traditionally masculine drive for career success also fraternity houses often have ranking systems where they rank each other based on who has hooked up with or is dating the hottest or girls from the top sororities fraternities have spreadsheets of the girls they're taking to formal they give points for who brings the hottest girls to formal and points for rank like how many women in one top tier sorority are coming to our formal and how many women in other top tier sorority are coming to formal and i know fraternities have w's and l's wins and losses of the week they do it in chapter which is a meeting by the way it's like w of the week is who hooked up with the hottest girl or the top tier girl and then l of the week is who hooked up with the ugliest girl sorry that's absolutely horrific that's horrific and something which I was actually very curious about is attitudes to promiscuity in the 1970s versus the 2010s, especially because sorority houses still have the rules of no boys, no boys allowed. Women are still concerned with their reputation. It's just what is considered promiscuous has changed in the last 40 years. The 1970s study took place amidst the sexual revolution. So sorority sisters were having sex with their boyfriends. They just had to be very subtle about it. During this study, one girl had actually been expelled, dropped, kicked out of her sorority because she'd had a sleepover at her boyfriend's apartment. Nowadays, what is considered as promiscuous has obviously changed. A lot of the time, sorority sisters' sexual lives are actually uplifted and celebrated, but you just can't be too sloppy with it. So that's such a horrible word. So basically, if you are having lots of sex with your boyfriend, good. If you are having a few situationships in a row, good. If you are having a cheeky one night stand here and there, good. But if you're having way too many one night stands or drunken hookups in a row, that is seen as sloppy, slutty and a bad representation of the sorority. And you could get dropped from your sorority for that. And in the 2010s, sorority sisters are very vocal about how, I mean, at least in this study, were very vocal about how unfair it is that women are not allowed to have alcohol or parties or boys over. And they are very vocal about the risk of sexual violence if these rules aren't changed. And to quote the study again, recently, some members of Greek organizations, including those at Vanderbilt, Duke, Emory, American University, Northwestern, and the University of North Carolina have begun to revolt. According to Marcus, the trigger for the revolt was a recognition of racial inequality in the historically white Greek system, but the rhetoric of revolt includes misogyny as well. The current movements to reform or destroy the Greek system is a powerful lever. Campus administrations and leaders can use it to change formal rules and regulations, decrease racial bias in recruitment and other areas, and end the regulatory power asymmetries that have always existed between fraternities and sororities. Such policy changes could reduce the power of the patriarchy patriarchal bargain, which requires women to maximize their well-being within the constraints of an asymmetrical power relations with men. It is about time that universities take gender equality seriously. Now, despite evidence that many people who are part of Greek life in school and the sorority system are beginning to revolt against the Greek system, that probably isn't happening at the University of Alabama because last year, or is it this year? Sorority enrollment rate at the University of Alabama is higher than ever. And I'm sure that is partly to do with the phenomenon and success of Bama Rush and Bama Rush talk. But as I said earlier, the University of Alabama, Bama Rush, takes place in a Republican stronghold state in the Deep South. A lot of these people who are enrolling in sororities and fraternities and are throwing themselves into Greek life are from very white, wealthy families whose parents are the types to fork out thousands of dollars for them to live in a fraternity or sorority house. And something which I actually forgot got to say in this video even though it was in my script this is very frustrating but something which makes these sororities and fraternities ones that cost four to nine thousand dollars a month to join in states like alabama is the fact that the gap and the disparity between the rich and the poor is already so large in these states alabama used to be the poorest state in america now it is the second poorest i think it's got to do with low uh, property taxes so a lot of people rich people move there so 
they don't have to tax the properties and there's no money going into the state so it just ends up being this toxic cycle of the poor stay poor and the rich stay really rich so it almost makes these sororities and fraternities even more sinister in a sense where the gap between the rich and the poor is already so large and that university and colleges like the university of alabama only make it larger so of course they're not going to go against the status quo not only is going against the status quo of sorority and fraternity rules it could possibly jeopardize their connections they could get dropped from a sorority for speaking out about it they could lose their fraternity connections and these sororities and fraternities do play a really big part in the trajectory trajectory is that the right word trajectory the trajectory of their future but also they're not going to go against the status quo because they've probably been raised in really traditional families and with traditional values and it's all they really know maybe sorority sisters at the university of alabama or those sort of very right-wing republican uh, deep south states are less inclined to discuss the sexism and misogyny rampant within the greek system because they want to reap the benefits from being in the Greek system. They still want to reap the benefits of the social capital of being in proximity with fraternity brothers. Because again, a lot of these women will meet their husbands at college and they want to meet someone from a fraternity who is from a wealthy family, who has good connections, who could set them up for the future. Something which is really noticeable from the get-go of watching any Bama Rush content is the complete lack of non-white Rushies and PMs and sorority sisters. And I'm sure this doesn't come as a surprise to anyone, but Greek life in America has very deeply entrenched roots in racism. Greek life was founded in the 1700s. The first ever sorority house was founded in the late 1800s. This system and these houses were founded on the basis of exclusion. Only white and wealthy people were allowed to join them. A lot of fraternities had exclusive in writing whites only policies. Both fraternities and sororities were founded pre-integration. So the first ever sorority was founded just five years after slavery was abolished in the US. And this doesn't just apply to the University of Alabama, but I do think that there is a reason why racism tends to linger in the Greek system in states like Alabama and not just linger, but run rampant in the Greek system. The University of Alabama actually has to be integrated by force in 1963, nearly 10 years years after the landmark Brown v. Board of Education decision, which outlawed segregation in education. And after that decision was ruled, Alabama Governor George Wallace had promised his supporters segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. And I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. <laughs> Governor George Wallace refused to integrate the University of Alabama, so much so that on the day of integration in 1963, he stood and physically blocked black students from entering the enrollment office. President John F. Kennedy had to deploy the National Guard to integrate the University of Alabama. The Bama Rush documentary shared a story about one, the only black sorority on sorority row at the University of Alabama found a cross burning in their yard in I think it was 1986 and it wasn't even where they lived it was one of the residences they were considering for their sorority house and an article that I used to research for this video was America's Most Powerful Fraternity by Philip Weiss I am going to be referencing this a lot later in the video this article is from 1992 Philip Weiss went to visit the sororities and fraternities in the University of Alabama and write an article about it and he stayed there for a couple of weeks and this article by the way I found out more about sorority and fraternity life and Greek life in the University of Alabama more from this article than I did from the Bama Rush documentary take with that what you will but whilst Philip was visiting these sororities and fraternities multiple of them had been embroiled in racism scandals two white sorority sisters went to a swap party dressed in blackface they were dressed as pregnant black women and the sorority party theme was who rides the bus 
And as soon as word of these offensive costumes overtook campus and word spread, students pointed out that a local photography agency had multiple pictures of Greek life students in blackface. One student had even dressed as Rosa Parks and Philip had heard about this in passing and one of the fraternity brothers told him, did you know Rosa Parks used to be Claude's daddy's maid? And as Philip Weiss writes for Esquire, the Greek life students publicly condemn this kind of behavior, but behind closed doors, not so much. Philip spoke to fraternity brother Chad Green. Chad had publicly condemned the girls' costumes, but between bites, he says, not that they did anything wrong. Many Greeks share that feeling. Privately, they say that the Kappa Delta pledges were just trying to be creative. Maybe they weren't the prettiest girls, so they found a different way of getting attention. One Sigma Chi said, it's not that like they woke up that morning and thought, how am I gonna insult the N-words today? Despite in the 90s, many Greek life students not thinking that blackface was that wrong, it didn't mean that they weren't embarrassed, especially because these racism scandals led to a march down sorority row in protest. A lot of these fraternity brothers believed that these kinds of matters should be handled privately. That's just a little hint of what we're gonna talk about later, by the way. The first sorority at the University of Alabama was founded in 1904, but not a single woman who was identifiably black was offered a bid until 2003, nearly an entire century later. And I'm not sure whether I would actually mention this in the video yet, but the sororities at the University of Alabama had to be integrated by force in 2013. This is after the student paper, The Crimson White, published a story about a black student not receiving any bids to despite her really high scores during the sorority rushing process. And upon further investigation, multiple sorority sisters claim that it's alumni who stand in the way of them accepting black students. They will pull black students' names from the pool before they can even nominate them to be part of their sororities. And if they try to push on it, they will threaten to pull their financial funding and backing. And maybe I'm negative, but at first I thought this sounded like a little bit of an excuse. Like I was like, oh yeah, of course you're gonna blame the people who are still attached to the sorority but not part of the sorority but I did read another article Philip Weiss's one um, which did back up the claim that alumni are behind um, not integrating sororities and fraternities. Everyone at Alabama says the fiercest opponents of integration are alumni especially the men from small towns who are most involved who come to the homecoming games and join their fraternity houses the ones who say that after family fraternity played the biggest part in their success Alabama Vice President Harry Nope says it was alumni who blocked one fraternity, he won't say which, from accepting an Asian American. A 2014 Mary Claire story reported that none of the 16 panhelic sororities offered a bid to a black student, despite the fact that 90% of women who rushed are offered a bid. In response to this, the university president, Judy Bonner, mandated some rules that to alter the recruitment process so more non-white students um, could be accepted and offered bids into sororities. She changed the recruitment process so members can be invited at any time rather than just during rush week and also to expand the size of the pledge class to include more diverse members. And even after integration of the sororities was enforced in 2013, racism still persisted. In 2014, a Snapchat of a Chi Omega sorority sister bragging that her chapter didn't accept any black members into their pledge circulated around campus. In 2018, a student was expelled from her sorority and the university after a video of her circulating where she says, I love how I act like I love black people because I fucking hate N-words. In 2021, two members from the same sorority, one being the president, were expelled from the sorority after sending racist text messages into a group chat. And issues and instances of racism are not just exclusive to sororities, it's rampant in all Greek life. Fraternities were literally founded on the basis of white supremacy. In 2015, two Sigma Alpha Epsilon members were expelled from the fraternity and the University of Oklahoma for singing a racist chant. And in 2019, Syracuse University had to suspend all fraternity activity after a black student was sub subjected to a racial epithet and this racism and bigotry led to the foundation and creation of black sororities. I read an article on Good Morning America titled The Divine Nine, The History of Black Greek Letter Organizations. The Divine Nine, according to the National Panhelic and Council website, evolved during a period when African Americans were being denied essential rights and privileges afforded to others. Racial isolation at predominantly white colleges and social barriers such as class also created a need for African Americans to align themselves with other individuals 
individuals sharing common goals and ideals. And some famous alumni from black sororities is Kamala Harris, John Lewis, Angela Bassett, Cheryl Lee Ralph, Michael Jordan, and Colin Kaepernick. They were all part of D9 organizations. Lawrence Ross, who is the author of The Divine Nine, The History of African-American Fraternities and Sororities, who joined the Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Inc. in the spring of 1985, says they understood that their education was not enough. They had to work as a group to lift up people who didn't have those circumstances and at the same time fight for themselves. And discussing his own fraternity experience, he says, I basically looked at Alpha as being the conduit for what I wanted to do with the African-American community, which was basically internal growth for my own self, working with brothers who actually have the exact same sort of mentality. And now there are nearly two million pan Hellenic, sorry, I can't pronounce that word, Pan-Hellenic council members. And it is often a generational tradition amongst family members. A lot of people will join the same sorority that their mum or the fraternity that their dad joined. And although these sororities and fraternities, they were created because of a joint struggle of racism and discrimination, members who have joined these organizations have become change makers in STEM programs, media finance, other professions, and have left a lasting legacy in today's society. Lawrence Ross adds, Fraternalism is designed to be a lifelong commitment and a lifelong commitment is not simply the networking between members, but using that commitment within the organization to push and accelerate the African-American community forward in this country, which is almost always under attack. And to quote Tyler McMillan, he is the director of youth and college at the National Action Network and he joined Phi Beta Sigma in the spring of 2018. Our organizations have always been at the front line of social change and that does not change today. I think that speaks to our rich legacy and we do that justice by continuing to carry that mantle. And unfortunately, these real horrific instances of racism within the white Greek system, it's not exclusive to the white Greek system. It seeps and bleeds into other aspects of American life, specifically politics. I would like to disclaim before you go into this segment of the video, this is all alleged. This is all alleged. Alleged, 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 allegedly, allegedly, alleged. Yes. In the Bama Rush documentary, the mystifying machine is mentioned by one of the sorority sisters that Rachel is interviewing. It was brought up very briefly, obviously, <laughs> as per the Bama Rush documentary mantra, but it's mentioned as a secret society with the top members from each top sorority and fraternity. They all meet up in one of the basements of the fraternity houses and they rig all of the elections, basically. And the Bama Rush documentary also shares a story of one not independent candidate for like I think it was SGA presidency and the Bama Rush documentary shared the story of one uh, independent SGA candidate who had her house broken into and was assaulted by someone who she believed was part of the machine but there is so much more to this than the Bama Rush documentary shared are we shocked the article that I used to reach did you guys just hear that? That was my stomach. Sorry, what the fuck? The article that I used to research for this segment of this video is The Most Powerful Fraternity in America by Philip Weiss, which I mentioned earlier in this video. Honestly, this is a really good article. It gave such a, honestly, a better insight into the white Greek politics um, of the University of Alabama than the Bama Rush documentary did in like a two hour documentary. I know, to be fair, I think it was an hour and a half. In Bama Rush's defense, Philip visited Delta to Delta which is an alleged machine-backed fraternity. And he spoke to one of the fraternity brothers, Chad Green, who was also allegedly part of the machine. And he also spoke to other fraternity brothers and sisters. He also spoke to other independent student politics candidates, people, politicians on campus as well. Weiss describes the machine as, the organization Chad won't talk about is a secret society that for 80 years has controlled student politics at the University of Alabama, the machine. Its real name is Theta Nu Epsilon, whose Greek letters spell out one, and it acts as the political arm of 27 leading fraternities and sororities at the school. Machine representatives meet secretly once a week. There are 30 or so members, Chad is said to be one, but most Greeks on campus don't know who their 
rep is. On election day in February, the machine buses its voters to the polls and penalises people who don't vote. Almost all the time, it wins. That's why it's called the machine, by the way, guys, because it literally works like a machine. On election night, it spends a chunk of its $27,000 secret budget on a blowout party at the JC Fairgrounds for the fraternities and sororities. The machine reps can be seen there, ducking in and out of a tent with a private bar. Some of them wear a label pin with the Theta Nu Epsilon logo, a skull and crossed keys. In this 1992 article, students who were part of Greek life only made up 20% of the 19,000 member student body, but they managed to control almost all student government offices, 40 of the 50 student senators were machine candidates, and controlled the student activity fee budget of nearly $300,000. And remember guys, student politics isn't just isolated to universities, student politics seeps out into real politics because student politics is just child's play for real politics. Many leading politicians in Alabama are alleged products of the machine. US Senator Richard Selby is allegedly a former machine president. His office denies this claim. And I just want to reiterate here that only 6% of women and 7% of men were a part of Greek life at their universities on campus. Yeah, let me read out some crazy statistics to you guys. Yet fraternity men make up 85% of US Supreme Court justices since 1910, 63% of all US cabinet members since 1900, and historically 76% of US senators. And that's not counting the 18 ex-frat US presidents since 1877, that's 69%. In the 113th Congress alone, 38 of the 100 Senate members came from fraternity and now sorority backgrounds, as does a full quarter of the house. Is there something inherent in the fraternity culture that sends its members to the country's top echelons? Atlantic, that's where I got all that info from. With peace and love, there is nothing inherent to the Greek life system that breeds geniuses. It's just to get into the Greek life system, you already have to be from an extremely wealthy family. And if your family's wealthy, they're usually well connected too. 120 of the Forbes 500 CEOs in 2003 were part of fraternities. It's not got anything to do with the fact that fraternities just breed geniuses. It's got to do with the fact that fraternities only allow in already rich people. <laughs> but if we steer back to the machine, remember how I mentioned earlier that a lot of fraternity brothers believe in private matters being handled privately, things being handled behind closed doors. Well, that was the whole reason why the machine was created. That's the whole basis of the machine foundation. The machine took root at Alabama a hundred years ago with something of the same idea about politics. Disputes should take place behind closed doors. The boys who started the fraternity nationally thought it seemed unseemly that fraternity men would fight openly for campus leadership positions. The men of one would quietly seek future leaders when they were sophomores and then sort out campus honours among them. The fraternity urged its chapters to start student governments as proving ground. Over the years, one had varying degrees of success at keeping itself a secret, but with the onset of the 60s, one had petered out, except to Alabama, where one had grown into the machine. The machine was exclusively male up until the 80s when they started letting in sororities. And this was not out of the kindness of their own hearts. It's not like they were like, wait a minute guys, this feminism stuff kind of has a point. It was because in the 70s, the sorority sisters started to desire more power and started running independently um, for SGA, student government positions. And the machine knew that they had to nip this issue in the bud. It was specifically after Cleo Thomas won SGA presidential election. And once the machine invited sororities to join, any sorority sister that wanted to support an independent candidate was threatened with sorority expulsion. And the machine used their campus political powers to benefit the sororities. In 1998, the sorority houses, they were running into a problem. They were losing out on homecoming queen. Uh, in 1986 and 1987, black women won homecoming queen through a block vote um, and they weren't happy about it. So they brought it to the machine and the machine introduced student legislation to break up block voting. This bill didn't even make it into student legislation, yet it still successfully changed the rules around block voting and it put the homecoming queen back into the sorority sisters hands. So I thought it might be, I don't know, helpful, interesting to make a little timeline of alleged, this is alleged machine behavior. And I do just want to say that the University of Alabama 
still denies the existence of the machine, which is pretty crazy. So in 1976, Cleo Thomas was elected as SGA president and she is still the only black candidate to ever be elected for SGA president. After her election, as many as 15 men cloaked in white sheets burned crosses, threw bottles and chanted various revolutionary tunes. And an eight foot cross was burned in her front lawn in front of the Kappa Kappa Gamma sorority house. In 1983, newly elected SGA president John Bolas, an independent candidate, discovered that his home phone had been tapped. Well, two students later confessed to the FBI and the VA administrations that they were the ones behind tapping the phone and they were, were believed to be part of the machine. In 1986, the machine broke into independent SGA candidate John Merrill's office. One member of Merrill's campaign was allegedly beaten outside a VA dorm and was hospitalized with rib injuries. Another member was ran off the road whilst driving to campus and Merrill's wife received rape threats. In 1989, Bamabino Pizza was forced to close after the owner's son, Joey Vaselli, who was an independent candidate, ran for SGA president. Bamabino's Pizza previously used to get really big orders from the sororities and fraternity houses for parties. And both sorority and fraternity houses boycotted the pizza joint, which led to it shutting down. And Joe Vaselli ended up losing his campaign. And nearly everyone on campus says that there was corruption because he was such a hugely popular candidate. And Joe Vaselli told the Crimson White student newspaper that he received multiple violent threats during his campaign. A couple of people jumped one of my campaign workers at his apartment. My mother was threatened in an extreme amount. We had bomb threats, he said. In 1993, Minda Riley, who was a Greek candidate, but she wasn't machine backed, was assaulted in her home by a knife wielding man with pantyhose pulled over his face. The attack left her with a golf ball sized bruise on her cheek, a busted lip and a knife wound on the side of her face. Minda's brother says he had no doubt the machine were behind the attack, saying that Minda had had a cross band on her lawn with two notes which which read, tonight crossbones burn, the next time your skeleton head will burn and machine rules, bitch. The University of Alabama actually ended up suspending the Student Government Association until 1996 for three years after this assault. In 1999, Fabian King Kanza, who was a black independent SGA candidate, was the target of multiple racist threats, which he believes the machine was behind. Kanza's posters were vandalized with racist graffiti and he received multiple threatening phone calls, one where someone threatened to hang him from a tree. In 2001, Melody Twilly wanted to be the first ever black woman knowingly accepted into a white sorority, but was dropped two years in a row. And many people believed the machine were behind it. In 2003, Carla Ferguson became one of the first black students to ever be knowingly accepted into a sorority, but her victory was met with allegations that the machine offered membership to a lower ranked sorority if they accepted a black student in order to try and fix their racist image. According to one comment on a Greek student messaging board. The machine is getting sick of everyone telling them how racist they are. So they decided to desegregate the sorority system this year. However, none of the top chapters wanted to risk their reputations by bidding an African-American student. So they wanted one of the not so prestigious sororities to do it instead. They promised Gamma Phi entrance into the machine as a bribe, which would theoretically raise their social standing on campus. In 2004, Emmeline Aviki, who was part of a machine-backed sorority, ran for an SJ position without the machine's position permission. According to Emmeline, who told the Crimson White she received multiple threats, including being told, you fucked up the day you started thinking against us. A sorority sister even told Emmeline she believed her life was in danger. Emmeline would transfer to Duke University, citing emotional and psychological toil from the campaign as her reason for transferring. And in 2013, I'm directly quoting this Business Insider article where I got this entire timeline from. The New York Times reported last month that a losing candidate for the Tuscaloosa City Board of Education filed a lawsuit after an SGA president and machine candidate was elected after a wave of Greek voting. UA sorority members were offered free drinks and limo rides if they voted in the City Board of Education elections, according to an email sent out to at least one sorority. Members were encouraged to vote for former SGA president Kaysen Kirby and fellow UA alumnus Lee Garrison, both of whom ended up winning their respective districts. Local news reported some Greeks listed their fraternity house as their residence to vote in Kirby's district, even though they no longer live there. As I cited from those statistics, these are the people that end up working in politics. This is just practice. This is just child's play for when they join the real political world. And it's scary knowing that these people 
are in charge of politics. It's similar here in the UK. A majority of MPs are privately educated, despite the fact that only 2% of the UK population are privately educated. And I think the reason why this relates to sororities is that, again, not all not all but a lot of sorority sisters do join sororities for proximity to these powerful fraternity men and what it means for their future to quote this article that i read on the new york times the article is called in alabama white tide rushes on by tressie mcmillan cotton joining an elite sorority solves multiple problems at one time it gives you a college cohort seeds your linkedin connections and grooms you into the ideal partner for the men who are joining the fraternities elite status culture invests a lot in marriage and that is no different in the south for all that the sorority sisters talk about bonding and lifelong friends the power of these sororities is not sisterhood it's the brotherhood that desires it Bama Rush codifies the many incentives behind marrying power and turns them into a long audition to become a handmaiden to patriarchal privilege, becoming pretty enough to sit at the right hand of machines that chew up history and the future is not my idea of getting ahead. So to conclude my final thoughts, I haven't actually written a conclusion for this video, so I am riffing a little bit, but a lot of people talk about making sororities more inclusive, more diverse, and in my opinion, and what is also written in this article in the New York Times, is you can't make something inclusive that was created on exclusivity. It reminds me a lot of, well, not a lot, a little bit of trying to make Victoria's Secret inclusive. It's kind of difficult to do that because the whole basis of Victoria's Secret was exclusivity. So it feels fake, it feels phony. Tressie mentions in her article that we sort of get this urge um, to take out our diversity hammer from our progressive toolkit and just like hit everything that is, you know, not diverse and be like, you should be more diverse, ding. But that's not the solution to something which is so deeply corrupt it's not you know will of course we're seeing a breakdown of greek life in some states and some universities and of course not all greek life is like this but i don't think that we're going to be seeing greek life slow down anytime soon in states like alabama where it's actively thriving thriving i think something that is just really interesting which really interests me is the way that people go about things in a post-gender revolution world and now a lot of women have to act like they're joining sororities because they want to create a sisterhood and they're not joining sororities for the connections to fraternities and security in their future and a lot of women aren't even honest about wanting to join sororities for their own connections for their own career and their own work but yeah I think that's all of my thoughts is that you just gotta get rid of the whole thing but I hope that you guys enjoyed this video. This took me such a long time to make and it was really, really interesting. And if you did, make sure you give it a little bit of love, follow my socials and leave a comment on your thoughts and I'll see you in my next video. Bye.